Red Hat and IBM partnered in 1999, sharing a vision for Linux ubiquity. Red Hat and IBM continue to apply the philosophy of an open architecture to virtualization, storage, and cloud computing, connecting our customers to innovation and the freedom to choose, now and forever. Now, please welcome Robert LeBlanc, Senior Vice President, IBM, to the 2012 Red Hat Summit. One thing I noticed, Jen, if you're in the backstage, I really like your intro music better than mine. <laughs> Anyways, thanks uh, for uh, joining me and allowing me to be part of this uh, conference. And like Jim said, I've actually been involved with Linux for a long time. In fact, I was going back in history, and in 1999, I was at the very first Linux world in Europe, at the, in Paris, at the Palais de Congrès. And Bob Young of Red Hat, the founder and CEO, was the keynote. And I've got an opportunity to follow Bob on stage. You turn the clock forward 13 years, and here we are. I can tell you there are a lot more people in the crowd than what we had in Paris in 1999. This thing really has grown up. And it's grown up because we're really helping solve some fundamental challenges that clients have because technology is affecting every industry and it's affecting every country around the world. Gone are the local economies, everything's becoming more and more global. And the impact of technology is moving up. I remember, I'll tell you a story, back in, in uh, 1999, I was in, a, in the Midwest with a fairly large client in the manufacturing space, and it was with the CIO. And we were talking about technology. And we happened to talk about Linux. And the CIO said, I don't pay attention to any of that. None of that open source stuff is ever going to show up in my shop. And he's going on and on. And off to the side is the operations manager. And he's kind of, every time the CIO would say something, he'd kind of hang his head. And he'd be looking at his shoes. The CIO said to him, I can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, Joe or whatever. He said, are you trying to tell me something? He goes, yes, boss. He goes, we have a lot of Linux in our shop. In fact, our whole inter intranet internet is all running on Linux today. And he says, we've got 60 servers. And the CIO had no idea. Now, the CIO today understands technology. But there's something else that's going on. Technology understanding and the impact of technology is moving up. In fact, we do a CEO survey every two years. And we've done it now for 10 years. We just completed a CEO survey. So your CEOs, think of it as your CEOs. And we ask a question. What is going to have the biggest impact on your business? Every year since we've had this survey, market, the market, the impact of the market, what's going on in the market has been number one. Guess what we saw this year? Number one is technology. No longer is the market factors the number one impact, but the most important external force is now technology. And look where it's come from since 2004. It has steadily climbed and is now the number one factor. 71% of these 1,700 worldwide CEOs said technology has never been more important to their business. Now, sounds good. The expectation level now is changing of what we can do with technology. So when you think about what's going on, and as I go around and talk to clients, I'll tell you three things, three themes come up all the time. And Jim uh, talked a lot about it, and talked about information. The massive amounts of data, over one trillion bytes, growing 50% every single year. How many of you can deal with that level of change, that level of information that needs to be driven? And most people think about that as being driven by social networking. I've got Twitter information, I've got blog information, you know, things that are outside of my control and my organization. Well, in fact, what's the number one driver of information 
is all these billions and billions of devices that are now being interconnected. If you think about where the microprocessor is showing up, it's showing up everywhere. And it's showing up in the most unusual places. Now, the other thing that's starting to change is the, the workforce. We really have moved to a mobile workforce. And they, in, t in turn, are driving all this interconnectivity and driving billions of these mobile devices where they want to be in control. They want to be connected. They want the information, and they want it now. Think about how society has changed with instant gratification. And you know, Jim showed that chart with all those apps showing up in smartphones today. In fact, there were more smartphones shipped last year than there were PCs. So think about that. And think about what you have in your possession and how it's starting to change the way you work. You're no longer tethered to that connectivity, that physical wire, or even wireless, which in some ways is, is limited. You now have more connectivity and the ability to work and play anywhere you want. The other thing that's happened is, as we've exploded in IT, we have exploded the expense that we spend on technology. But you know what? We always have to plan for the worst case. And that has driven us to a point where 85% of capacity out there is idle at any one point in time. So you sit there and you think about the inefficiencies and the inefficient use of technology. Pretty profound. Those three things are going to have to be solved for us to be able to take technology to the next level and take our ability to drive technology. Now, what does a CIO look at this? When the CIO thinks about all this, he's thinking about technology. In fact, at the CIO survey, we asked them specifically, what innovation and technology do you believe can help you with your business challenges? Not surprising, analytics, number one. Information, we are in the information age. Jim was right on, we are all in the information age. And those that can take information and can glean information are the ones that are gonna lead their industries in the next millennium. Mobility, you can't tie people down. And guess what? The next generation of users, they're not gonna be tied down like a lot of us were. They're, they will not accept what we were accepting five, 10 years ago. Virtualization and cloud, I combine the two. I think for the most part, those that think of virtualization are in the, the first grade of cloud. They think, oh, I'm virtualized, there you go. I'm at, I'm now I'm a cloud, because I'm virtualized. In fact, interesting stat, only about 3% of people who have virtualized environments move their virtual machines from, from server to server. When you can provision and deprovision and move things around, that's how you get efficiency. Just virtualizing a machine doesn't necessarily give you all of the power of cloud. So cloud is actually coming up, and virtualization is going down. I, I really look at them as pretty synonymous. And then the last one that's becoming more important, it's becoming a board issue, is security. And you talk to any CEO, and they worry about cybersecurity. Because they view cybersecurity as that silent killer that could have an impact on their business. You know, just go out there and ask, you know, for companies that have had public, you know, situations like Zappos or Epsilon, and ask them the impact that, that has had on their business when they had a security uh, challenge within their organization. So you got all these challenges. And open computing has really been at the forefront of solving these challenges for the last two decades. And that's not going to change. Because we still have the challenges of interoperability. Things don't connect and work together the way they should. That's why there's a services industry. I always say there's, there's a services industry because we who build the technology, you know, we don't build it with ease of use with that level of interoperability. Otherwise, I wouldn't need to bring in teams and teams 
of programmers and consultants to make this stuff work together. You got the heterogeneity, the rate of change. The businesses, our businesses are going to change at a much more rapid pace. You think it's changing fast now? I'll contend that the rate of pace is nothing like we've seen. It is going to accelerate. So what's even more important is that we look at open computing and the advantages that it can bring, because it's the only way we're going to be able to solve all these challenges with the rate and speed that is expected of our businesses. And if we don't deliver that, who is going to? Open standards, community development, accelerated innovation. That's what it's all about. When I think of open computing, and I go back into the early days when I was involved in Linux, and in fact, I had, was part of a team that did a study, and we are the ones that went forward to the IBM company, to the CEO at that point, Lou Gerstner, and said, Lou, we want to throw the weight of IBM behind Linux. Hence, a lot of the early discussions with our partner, Red Hat, because we saw fundamental change that was going to allow some of these challenges to be addressed, but more importantly, we wanted to accelerate innovation, because innovation is good for business. And when the tide rises, all boats are going to rise. Now, I think there's some lessons to be learned as we think about the next generation of open computing. And let's look at Linux. From my perspective, there were four fundamental successes that we had in Linux. One was shared community. One was open code. We truly, truly allowed everybody to participate. But as you know, it is also a brutal meritocracy. Only those that really, really can bring value are the ones that get code accepted. It's got to bring tangible value. It can't be just a better mousetrap, a better operating system. It has to bring value to the client. And more importantly, and the one that I heard a lot in the early days of Linux, can it scale? And does it have the security that I need to run my business? And I think over the last two decades, we've proven a lot. And certainly, read the Red Hat team and all you contributors who contribute to Linux. Oh, there we are. We're back. Now, there's some, I know there's some thunder and lightning out there. I don't know if I want to be hooked up. Um, you know, you, you really, really proved it out. So congratulations to all of you, because you really have had an impact on, on the industry. Now, if you take a look at what we do in IBM, every single system we ship, we have Linux. In fact, we just announced a new generation of systems called Pure Systems, which is our ability to integrate hardware and software. What's the underpinning operating system that's driving all of that? Linux. We didn't, we didn't choose another operating system. We, cho we chose Linux because we believe it brings the greatest ability for open computing and allow others to play in the ecosystem. We have over 500 IBM engineers whose job it is to contribute to the open computing effort, to bring some of the ideas that we have and experience we have to the community. We've done over 15,000 client engagements that I would qualify as Linux engagements. Not, oh, yeah, they're using Linux over here, but we really didn't talk about it, but 15,000 that I consider we had an impact on the client's decision. And by the way, inside of IBM, our manufacturing site that builds the next generation chips that run, you know, not only servers, but run a lot of the games that you're all playing, all runs on Linux. Our internal IT systems to support the 500,000 IBMers around the world, what does that infrastructure run on? It runs on Linux. So you know what? We're not just talking about it. We're actually using it ourselves at the scale that I think surprises a lot of people. Now, that's looking backwards. If I look forward, let me tell you the three things that I think we need to help solve in the, in the open community. One, we have to get to open virtualization. Okay? 
there is still a lot of churn in this world of virtualization, and it comes back to not only virtualization, but also to cloud. There are too many people that are trying to control the pieces. If there's one thing we've learned, you don't want the pieces to be controlled. You want to allow innovation to go up on top. The more people that can innovate, the more we bring value. And then big data. Now remember, big data is being driven not only by social, but big data is being driven because everything is being interconnected. Now I'm going to give you a couple of things that I think are really important and give you some client examples why I think this is real. So why is open virtualization? Well, look, we need it. We got to get to higher scalability. We got to get to advanced security. The whole ability to, to visualize, control, and automate. I always say when I look at cloud, cloud is virtualization, it's automation, and it's standardization. You know, Jim talked about the components and the standardized components. We've got to get there. Think about how many technologies out there or standards around virtualization. A VM is not a VM is not a VM because there are too many variations out there. And clients are starting to really struggle with that. So that's why, you know, KVM here is really, really important. Now, it leads in some of the benchmark, but I can tell you, here's what, what I hear from clients, from some of you. You know what? We're not that, we are not uh, the leader in virtualization. Open virtualization is not winning the war for virtualization. There are other vendors out there that are innovating and pushing the envelope faster than what we're seeing in KVM. So my challenge to all of you is how do we all band together and bring it to the next level? Because we know clients love it when they can get the value. Now, Dutch Cloud we worked with on open virtualization. We actually helped them go from VMware to KVM to host their private cloud. Now, what they do is they host clouds for medium-sized businesses who, frankly, don't have the time the energy, or more importantly, the skill to move to cloud computing. They were able to reduce their time to provision 200 VMs by 90%. It was KVM and some of the provisioning capability from IBM that allowed them to get there. They can now support six times the revenue while their operational costs stayed the same. That's value to a client because now they make more money. So the technology is an enabler. Now the next area of big data, and Jim alluded uh, to big data at Hadoop. The challenge we've got is you're dealing with not only a lot of data, that's the volume side of it. I will contend there's three Vs. In fact, I'll talk about a fourth V. There's variety. Because you can't just deal with unstructured data. You have to worry about structured data that you have in an organization. In fact, our ability to bring structured and unstructured data together, look for patterns, and be able to do predictive analytics on that information is what is going to differentiate the strong from the weak going forward in an information age. Those who can take that information very quickly, and it, when I say quickly, I uh, talk about velocity. Uh, data, think about data warehousing. I always like to think about data warehousing like driving a car. How many of you drive your car by looking in the rear view mirror to see what happened? If you do, let me know. I want to be off the road. What do you do? You're watching. You have patterns in your mind, and you're watching the light, the color of the light, the conditions of the road, is it going left? Is it going right? What the car in front of you is doing? And you do look backwards to see what's going on behind you, but think about you know, real-time capability. We're going to have to analyze data at the velocity of data, at the volume in real time. And the, third, the fourth V you've got to worry about is veracity, the, the quality of the data. When I have all the data inside my data center, I can use standard tools to cleanse the data. I can transform, I can cleanse the data, I can take data that's not real. Now when you're gathering data from all over the internet, you're gathering it from machines, how do you know what's real? How do you know what is good data, bad data? And if you're gonna make decisions on data, you have to have some control over that data. 
And you also have to allow ad hoc analysis. There's one thing we're still struggling with, I think, in the industry, Hadoop. How many of you use Hadoop? Yeah, there's only about a dozen people. Now, I suspect you are a very smart individual, OK? Because I always say Hadoop is for the PhDs, that the average user, line of business user, who's going to make the decisions, who is going to be dependent on ad hoc analysis, who want to search that data, they don't really have that capability today. So we're still in the early stages. But I'll tell you, I think this is going to have a profound impact on organizations. The volume, the variety, the velocity, and the veracity of being able to understand and use data is going to make the difference in a lot of clients. I'll give you an example. KTH uh, Technical University in Sweden did some work on analyzing flow of, of traffic. So they look at the things coming from GPS systems. They have monitors that, that produce information on the roads. They have done some work on environmental impacts. They gather that information. They now can look and predict in the future where traffic should flow. And because of that, they've shortened the travel time for drivers in Stockholm. Now, if you're a driver, that's great. But I'll tell you what's more important. They've been able to reduce their carbon emissions in Stockholm by 30%. So there's an unintended consequence there of some of the things that we can do with technology that are going to have a more profound than just helping Stockholm. Think about what's happening around green and the environment and how important that is. So their ability to get all this information and analyze in real time allows them to change traffic patterns. They can change lights. They can reroute traffic very, very quickly. The, the third one is open cloud. You know what? OpenStack is really important. There's 178 companies involved. In fact, both Red Hat and IBM are part of the governing body. And it's really important because guess what? We have to ensure interoperability. There's going to be a lot of technologies out there, but they have to work together. You have to give the client the choice of the supplier. Okay, The client is the arbiter, not we in the technology uh, industry, not we as individual vendors. We've got to remove the barrier to entry, and we've got to protect the investment that they're making. I think we're just at the cusp of the power of the cloud. It's a lot of hype. In my 30 years in this industry, I don't think I've seen anything more hyped than cloud. But when you peel the onion and you think about it, I just want to use the resources I have efficiently. I want to virtualize. I want to take my VMs. I want to move them around to different resources. I want to move the, the uh, application VM closer to the resources it uses. I want to reduce latency. I want to improve response time. And I want to utilize the hardware and the systems that I have in a much more effective fashion. The value is pretty clear. The technology is not. So I think you're going to see more and more clients demand from all of us a much more open world here when it relates to cloud. And we've worked with Argon. And in fact, they never looked at the problem as a cloud problem. You know, what they do is they do research projects on scientific workloads. And what they said is, wow, if I have a cloud and I can move the workload to where I have the resources, could I, in fact, improve my use of, of the resources, improve my flexibility, and lower the cost? And guess what? They can do exactly that. And so therefore, when they have urgent computing needs, no problem. They move the work. Instead of bringing in, oh my god, I've got urgent workload. I've got to bring in yet another server. I've got to install all the additional software, which can take, in a lot of organizations, can take months. I've got the need now. So they're able to use cloud computing to provision and deprovision their virtual machines. So we've come a long way in Linux. You know, I've been lucky. I've been there since the early days. I still believe we're at the cusp. And the next era of computing is going to be dependent on all of us maintaining an open mind 
and helping drive open computing. Because open computing is going to be a catalyst for all that technology that's going to have an impact that the CEO is talking about. CEO wouldn't know a cloud from an anthill. But what they do know is technology is the difference maker. So, you know, it's important that all of us understand the impact for our organizations and be the catalyst for allowing technology to really bring forward more value. So, while you're here at the summit, take advantage, learn more about all of the open computing technologies that are available from Red Hat and all its partners. You know, explore the partner booths. You know, and by the way, we do want you to work hard while you're here, but we also want you to play hard. So make sure you take time to join us at Fenway Park for a very interesting evening at, uh, at probably one of the most iconic uh, places in the US, and that's Fenway Park. So you know what? Open computing is not about a single vendor. It's not about Red Hat. It's not about IBM. It is about what all of us collectively can do. So continue to hold that candle and continue to drive open computing so that we can have technology drive the change in the world. And in IBM, we've got a tagline. We want to make it a smarter planet. What we really want to do is allow technology to really fulfill the promise and not be something that people look at as a necessary evil. So with that, enjoy the rest of the Red Hat Summit. Thank you.